Hey y'all, my name is Adina Barnett Miller, but I'm known to my students as Mrs. B. I've been passionate about West Virginia history for as long as I can remember, but my mom would tell you it all started when I was three years old and she bought me a West Virginia County's puzzle at Geno's Pizza. I've taught history in Ripley, West Virginia for over 20 years now, and I'm an adjunct professor who teaches college West Virginia history to high school students. Please join me for West Virginia History with Mrs. B, a field trip across the mountain state to walk in the footsteps of those who came before us. Hey y'all, it's West Virginia History with Mrs. B, and we are now today in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and we are at Fort Gorman, historic Fort Gorman, and so we're going to talk about history, but we're also going to talk about the impact of geography and what that geography looks like from this beautiful viewpoint, this vantage point of Parkersburg, Wood County, as well as the state of Ohio. And so, as you can see, the beautiful Ohio River, it's a gorgeous day uh, to come up here. Um, we're going to give you some history about what we're looking at. So, we're at Fort Borman Park, and so this sign explains a little bit about Fort Borman and about its history. Fort Borman was named for Parkersburg, uh, son of... Uh, the first governor of the state of West Virginia, Arthur I. Borman. Here he is. Here's his photo. Um, he will become governor of West Virginia. He will be inaugurated on June 20th, 1863, the same day that West Virginia officially becomes a state. And so Fort Borman was constructed in 1863 to protect the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which if you look out here, you can see the, uh, the bridge that was built after the Civil War, but the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad ended here in downtown Parkersburg and so it was important that this railroad remained in Union hands during the Civil War and so the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad is the most important east-west rail line. It linked the Atlantic coast with the American interior, was vitally important for, important for the safe shipment of military supplies as well as U.S. Army troops. It says the safety of the railroad depended on it being defended against Confederate attacks that could happen anywhere along hundreds of miles of track. There are going to be entire like companies and groups whose job, sole jobs, is to protect uh, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad all across uh, the future state of West Virginia. And so it says here, <coughs> at first federal officials were slow to act and then they erected a series of blockhouses and fortifications to protect the line as well as the rail yards and the bridges. So on August 21st, 1863, Oh, Colonel Daniel Frost from Ravenswood, <laughs> 11th West Virginia Infantry, took formal possession of Fort Borman, named for the new governor. Although Frost declared the fort completed and ready for heavy artillery in September, in fact, improvements such as huts for winter quarters continued to be made as well as as late as November of 1863. During the remainder of the war, several artillery units manned the fort successively. The guns were fired only for visiting dignitaries, well hallelujah, and on special occasions such as the 4th of July, never in anger and never because they were being attacked. After the war, the fort was raised and the quarters were burned. This became um, listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2003. What's well, kind of sad, but very cool this used to be quite the place to come and picnic and visit um, after the Civil War and then it fell into disuse and it was just all grown up and just forgotten about and so it's going to take the efforts of lots of people here in Wood County um, to bring it back and to preserve it and so after they do that in the 1990s this is going to be added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2003. This is like a must see place in Parkersburg because I think it helps you understand Parkersburg's strategic importance um, once you come up here and you look over the hill where we're going to show you. Um, this is a picture of Governor Borman. It says he was West Virginia's first governor. He was a prominent Parkersburg resident. If you look probably right down there, just a couple of blocks is where his house was. He was born July 24th, 1823 in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. He moved at age four with his family to Middleburn in Tyler County. He studied the law 
under his older brother and brother-in-law, James McNeil Stevenson of Parkersburg. He was admitted to the bar in 1845, practiced in Parkersburg, was elected to many offices. He'll be the president of the Second Wheeling Convention, and then he'll be a circuit judge in Parkersburg. He was also a U.S. Senator, and he will die in Parkersburg in 1896. So, uh, this is a cool place to visit, and we're going to show you more. All right, we have just moved down a little bit from the last sign, um, but this sign beautifully shows what we're actually seeing here um, over the sign. And this is the Little Kanawha River right here. Um, it runs from Elizabeth, well, Glenville to Elizabeth to Parkersburg, and it dumps into the Ohio River right here. This right here is the historic point. You see where that cupola thingy is down there? That's called the point. And originally Parkersburg's name was New Point, uh, Newport. And that was the point. This is where downtown has always been in Parkersburg. So this is of course of strategic importance because the Little Canal is going to be really important in the oil and gas industry. So you can see if you look upriver, that's Marietta that way and then down river that's that's we're headed towards Ravenswood that way okay so this sign tells us um, at the beginning of the Civil War Parkersburg had 2,500 residents it had doubled in the 1850s the southern branch of the Baltimore and Ohio, Ohio Railroad was finished in 1857 it parallels what is now Route 50 at the time it was the Northwestern Turnpike Parkersburg was the largest Ohio River town between Wheeling, of course, the capital of West Virginia, and then Cincinnati. So Parkersburg, the railroads what made Parkersburg strategically important. It had an inner outer depot, a roadhouse, repair shops, and this was in, invaluable for maintaining the railroad trains. They also had a telegraph office, a two-story freight shed, a loading dock and even a wharf on the Little Canal because they've already started to haul um, gas from Work County. And Parkersburg in 1861, it was that area right there is what was Parkersburg. Um, there were several hotels. This section of Parkersburg down here on the other side of the flood wall along the Little Canal, it says that it was grimy and lawless, noted for its saloons, brothels, and seedy boarding houses. During the war, there were at least five military hospitals, a supply depot, a commissary in the city. Hundreds of thousands of Union soldiers passed through the city because trains came here. Um, it says the war brought great changes to Parkersburg. It was changed overnight from a sleepy courthouse town to a hub of industry and transportation. Civil War changes it because oil and gas industry is going to hit big time after the Civil War. By 1870, Parker, uh, Parkersburg is going to increase by 5,500 and then oil and gas just makes this like a boom, boom, boom town and lots of money is going to be um, located centrally located here in Parkersburg and it will be a fashionable grand and glorious glass gas lit society and a lot of those remnants of that wealth are just that way if you go up that street uh, that's to the Julianne historic district right up there and so you can drive through there and check those houses out all right, so this gives us another vantage point at which to look out over the Ohio River in this gorgeous bend. And so you can see right there where the muddier waters of the Little Canal are flowing into the Ohio River here. If you look down that way to where that barge is located, that's Blennerhassett Island. Um, in the summer and spring, you hop on the boat right here at what we call the point. There's going to be a paddle wheeler that takes you down to the island and then you can take the tour of the house. So let's talk about the beautiful Ohio River as the sign points out. Um, it was called the La Belle Riviere by the French and it is derived from the Iroquois word meaning good river or large river. It is 981 miles long. It goes from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Cairo. And Fort Borman was just constructed here on what was called Mount Logan. And of course you can see it has this fabulous view of all of like the Mid-Ohio Valley. Um, I just I love this view up here. We couldn't ask for a better 
better day, sunnier weather so you can enjoy it. And since the leaves are off the trees, you can really see a wide expanse. It says it, well, this was a, a site that was important to riverboat transportation, the war effort, and of course, the train. Before the Civil War, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad stopped here. The, the cars were loaded onto a ferry and they were ferried over to Belpre, but then they're gonna build this bridge. If you look, the black bridge right beside of that green bridge, that is gonna be the Baltimore and Ohio uh, bridge that goes through town. They're gonna build it and finish it in 1872. Um, and at the time that it was built, it was the longest bridge of its type in the world. So pretty cool stuff. <coughs> and so that bridge means that you don't have to shuttle the, the passenger cars across the river by ferry anymore. It says it points out across, uh, across from the confluence of the Ohio and Little Canal is Belpre, which is the second oldest permanent settlement in the Northwest Territory. Of course, that first permanent settlement is just up the river at Marietta. Um, it's kind of the capital of the Northwest Territory. And the oldest building in the Northwest Territory, which was the, the land agent building where you could go buy your property, it, um, it's there still in Marietta to this day. So uh, Belpre's number two, Marietta's number one. And so it says here, Belpre was settled in 1789 by members of the Ohio Company of Associates and they called it Bell P Prairie for beautiful meadow. So, and there was a block house here called the Farmer's Castle um, during the French Indian War. So this is just a great place to visit and read the signage. All right, so you can't talk about Parkersburg without talking about Blennerhassett Island. And so this sign is all about Blennerhassett Island, which is just right there. If you look at where the boat is, it's getting ready to go around the uh, side of Blennerhassett Island. And so this sign has a historic image of Blennerhassett Island on it. It says one and one half miles below the confluence of the Ohio and the Little Canal, which we just looked at is the Blennerhassett Island, um, which was home of Margaret and Harmon Blennerhassett. He was all messed up with Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr had this whole plan. He was going to uh, take over and start his own country uh, in the uh, Southwest. And so he'll be arrested for treason. Of course, they can't get it to stick, um, but he, you know, got the Blunder Hassets involved. The Blunder Hassets are going to basically, their island home is going to be trashed and they're going to end up destitute. As the sign points out, this island we know has been continuously inhabited for 13,000 years, most of that time by uh, indigenous people. Um, a famous Indian guide and trailblazer, Nima Colon, lived there in the 1760s. Other people who visited included George Rogers Clark, Johnny Appleseed, Henry Clay, Walt Whitman, and gentleman Jim Corbett. And that there are going to be um, Ohio volunteer infantry who guard the island because they thought that when um, Morgan, John Hunt Morgan was on his raid through uh, Ohio that this was where he was going to cross but he ended up crossing down in Jackson County um, and across to Meigs County um, at Buffington Island and not at Blinter Hassett Island uh, but if you have the opportunity to come to Parkersburg and take the tour of Blinter Hassett Island and take the tour of the museum you should most definitely do it because it is a great tour and so you can see right here that head south to Ravenswood and it's not far from the point to Blennerhassett Island itself. All right, hey y'all, we have uh, moved locations. We are now standing on the banks of the Little Kanawha River overlooking downtown Parkersburg. So if you're looking at the horizon there, that's like the Wood County um, Judicial Annex. If you just go right up there, there's the, you see the building with the big like orange steeple looking thing. That's the Wood County Courthouse. And just right down the street from that is the historic Blunder Hassett Hotel. If you look right here where I'm pointing, right near the sheets, that's the Oil and Gas Museum. And then right up from it here, the building with the uh, green awnings, that is the Blunder Hassett 
Island Museum, which is really, really good and is open all year long. So if you're here in the wintertime, you can still stop by and see both of those museums. So, but this gives you a good idea of what the little canal looks like. Um, they tried damming it to give it some more height, but they were never able to really use big boats on the Little Canal River. And so it's going to take the building um, of a railroad up along the river to be able to haul the oil and natural gas that is going to be captured in Work County, Wood County, and throughout this entire region along the Little Canal River. So I just love looking at that straight view imagine as a boat coming here and then coming out into the the mass of ohio river i mean it had to be pretty cool so i just think about you know what our ancestors must have thought when they looked at these places um but downtown parkersburg it's it's not a big city um but at one time there was so much concentrated serious wealth in Parkersburg, West Virginia because of the oil and gas industry. And so um, there's still wealth here today. Um, it's just, it's not like it, it once was, um, but it's still a beautiful place to come and visit. Um, make sure you use your GPS if you're not from here because the roads make no sense. Um, even if you've been driving them your entire life. What do you think, Dave, on that account? Mm, yes. My husband grew up in Charleston, so he is not a, he does not drive Parkersburg fluently. He needs my navigation. And so um, Route 50, which is down below us, which is now a four lane, it used to just be a two lane when it got to like the seventh street exit on 77. So this is the four lane. This compounded things. So like if you knew where you were going, then when they put Route 50 in, it made it way more confusing. So, um, this is a really cool place to visit. It's open um, till dusk every day, um, 365 days a year. So you should definitely come up here and um, just take in the view, take in the scenery and appreciate how gorgeous Ohio, uh, not Ohio, but Parkersburg and the Ohio Valley is. Thanks y'all for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to West Virginia History with Mrs. B on both Facebook and YouTube.